everyone, I'm Joel. I am a UI developer here at Nexus, and uh, today we're going to talk about building JavaScript with JavaScript. Woo! It, is, it is it is doable. It's possible. We live in a world where this is this is something you can do every day. Um, so this is my slide. Hopefully, we'll have a nice link for you to actually view these slides because there's these nice links in here that will direct you to the repo that accompanies this presentation um, and. Some more fun information about me, where you can find me on the Twitter sphere, email, you know, the huge. So, uh, so let's 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 press on here. Um, kind of want to start out by just simple statement that front end is is hard. There's a lot of things that web developers need to take into account when working on front end applications. These are just kind of the big ones that immediately come to mind. The first is that JavaScript doesn't really come modularized for us. So it's kind of left as an exercise to the developer to make it modular and pick a method of doing that. Um, before in the 90s, this was just dropping script tags on pages. If you're familiar with doing that, it's kind of cumbersome. Anytime you write a new script, put it on the page, yada, yada. There's a lot of steps involved. And if you forget something or don't do it in the right order, it breaks, which just kind of stinks. Um, CSS is another problem. Uh, it's declarative, and I call it dumb. <laughs> There's really not a lot of logic in CSS. You pretty much bang out what you want styles to do in a very, well, declarative fashion, and it does what you tell it. Um, so that's that's cumbersome. It'd be nice if we could do some sort of logic, have variables, you know, just things that we're used to when we program. There's also multiple interpretations of a web browser. Um, anybody that's worked in Internet Explorer has obviously seen this. Different browser vendors will do different things for different types of animations, colors, different APIs for things, it's just a huge pain. Um, large images are also really fun when you're dealing with mobile web browsers. If you have a big image or a nice image thing you want to show, you, you kind of have to take some, some tools out there and compress it so it's quick to, quick to load on you know mobile phones, that sort of a thing. Uh, last one's my personal favorite, which is, hey, can I see your app? It's like, well, not really. I'm on a local network, and not a lot of people can see it unless you like dial into where I'm at. and so that's, that's kind of the, the gist of it. So these are the things that we're going to try to accomplish. So let's talk about fixing this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all our JavaScript, we're going to bundle it into one file, which is really nice for user experience. There's one script on the page, it loads, that's it. All your dependencies load in the right order, we'll take care of that. Um, unit tests, we want to run our unit tests in all the browsers that we are concerned about. Um, so we're going to take care of that. We're going to compile all of our CSS or star CSS, it's actually SAS into a file. Um, so this build will handle all of that. We're gonna minify images. We're gonna build two versions of this. We're gonna build a, a developer version and a production ready version, also known as like dev and prod. Um, we're gonna make this available to anybody that wants to view it. Um, we'll show you that, just build a simple link that anybody can put in their browser and visit your site right away. Um, and if we have time for it, which I think we do, we'll do some super secret bonus content, which you'll, you'll kind of want to hang out for that. So, um, all right, so what's the first part of this? Well, first part is we have to wrangle all these procedures into one manageable thing, a task runner, if you will. Um, if you've worked in JavaScript before, chances are you'll see a task runner uh, called grunt around. Um, that's, that's the big one. So a um, little foreshadowing here, if you can see the picture, there is a man carrying a delicious large sugary beverage, uh, which just happens to be the name of another task runner called Gulp. Gulp is fantastic. Uh, really under the hood, Gulp is just JavaScript. It's not a big configuration file that you have to manage. It's not some other language. It's not Maven. It's not any of those things. It's, it's JavaScript. Um, being that it is JavaScript and it's really simple, there's only four methods you have to worry about. There's a source method, a destination method, a task, and a watch method. We'll cover all of those um, in, in pretty good detail, just so you kind of know what they do. Um, Gulp uses streams, so whenever you want to do like a compilation step, it's it's just a stream of that file. Streams are a big node thing. If you've never used streams, it's really great to work with. It makes seeing what like the workflow is for an asset really clear. It's very manageable, easy to read, easy to use. So. Um, yeah, I, if you haven't used streams, I would definitely take take some time and look at streams because they're very handy. Uh, most importantly, it's just JavaScript. You already know this, or at least I hope you know this. If, if not, you're watching the wrong video. Probably you probably should watch some you know Crockford videos on how to JavaScript. Um, but yeah, it's just JavaScript. So 
tasks or functions, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Uh, if you get this slide presentation, I got two links if you want to check out some more things about Gulp versus Grunt, or sort of when Gulp came out, how it overnight transformed you know, the JavaScript compiling industry. So two links for your viewing pleasure. Um, okay. This is where the fun begins. I have prepared for you a nice GitHub repo. Alongside that, there is these uh, tags in Git that you can check out any part of this talk at any stage. If you're a Git wizard, you can see the deltas of you know where things change, just just so you kind of can wrap your head around you know what's going down uh, as we work through this. Um, so yeah, if you're, you're curious about the JavaScript portion of this, you'd obviously want to check out the JavaScript tag. I will be doing this in the command line, so you very clearly see how this works. Um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's do this thing. Um, first task is our JavaScript task, and as we sort of outlined at the beginning, we're gonna read an entry point, in this case, the index.js file, and it's gonna go through and get all those dependencies and build us a single JavaScript file. Um, we're gonna have it check in node modules for any NPM stuff. If you're not familiar with NPM, it's, it's a package manager for JavaScript. So this build task will look there too as well if you want to use an open source thing in, in part of your application, which is obviously suggested. Um, we're going to bundle that into a single JavaScript file. Um, source maps, we're going to make a source map for this too. And essentially source maps will point back into the code where this source of uh, code came from. So we're going to build that so it just makes it easier to debug. You can see exactly what file it came from, just kind of a handy thing. We're going to place a human readable version in the build dev folder, and we're going to place an ugly copy in the build disk folder, um, essentially synonymous with production. So that's that's where it's going to go. Um, okay, let's do this, guys. We're going to we're going to jump into some code now. So here I am in my repo. This is the building JavaScript repo. So I'm going to do git checkout JavaScript. Um, so now we are in the JavaScript portion of our Git repository. If you haven't already done it, you probably will need to do an npm install to get the you know open source dependencies that I have for this. Um, but yeah, that's a quick few minutes, so I would run that first before doing this. Okay, so we are now in our JavaScript part of the build. So let's actually um, look at some code here. So here is a our gulp file. Gulp file is a lot like a grunt file if you've ever worked on it. Essentially, it's just another JavaScript file. We are going to require a few open source things. The first being the gulp build system. We're going to require a config for how we manage all of our JavaScript, which is known as Webpack. Webpack is how we do all of our dependency management. Um, we're going to require the Webpack plugin, for, or the excuse me, the gulp plugin for that, as well as the uglify plugin, which just makes it mangled and smaller and loads lighter. So, so yeah, here it is, right here, and it's not even ten lines of code. Like, it's it's this right here. All of that gets bundled into one file, and you have a JavaScript build system already. Not even 10 lines of code, and we're done. So let's, let's walk through this real quick. So this is the full first uh, part of the Gulp API like I was telling you about. Task just simply takes a name, in this case JS, and assigns it a function to call. So anytime you type in Gulp JS, it'll actually load this function and do this action. The next part is we're gonna um, return the source property, which just takes the file name, in this case, we're pointed to source JS and then index.js, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then after that, it's just all streams, baby. We're just going down the pipeline. So it's just one tube to the next. We're going to pipe it into our webpack, which will read all our dependencies, pull it all together. We're going to build a, a, that developer ready version. We're going to uglify it and we're going to put it in our, our distributed directory. So super clean, super readable, really easy to do. So Let's, uh, let's show you what this command looks like. So I'm back in that same directory, just type in gulp js like we defined earlier. Boom, that's it. So let's take a look here. So pretty much we had some, some logging information and we finished it in 220 milliseconds. That's a lot quicker than you can copy and paste a script link into a page, my friend, I guarantee you that. So, so that's it, we're done. JavaScript is built and ready to go. Um, they may be asking yourself, hey, I want to see this on a page. I want to see what this is doing. We'll get there. We're going to build a little web server and do all that fun stuff. But first, let's take a look at actually what that script is. So we have our index.js file, which essentially we require a, a person folder, 
person module. We're going to make a new person, which is yours truly. And then we're going to console log what the get name method does. And inside of person.js, this kind of defines that person module. Um, feel free to play with this a little bit if you want. It's pretty basic. There's not a whole lot going on here. But just so you know what our JavaScript is doing, essentially, this is, this is pretty much it. So OK. So I think that concludes our first task. Um, oh yeah, let me show you the node modules part because that's important to know too. If you notice back in our gulp file, we required on line two like a config file. Let's show you that really quick. So this is just a simple little object. What we're going to say is, hey, we're going to cache this whenever we can so it just builds quicker the next time. We're going to output the file to this file name. Um, this is where the sugar is right here, this resolve. We're going to have it look for that name anywhere in mod node modules first before we defer to our own code. So that way if you have like, um, like a WebSocket module or something, it'll look in NPM first before it does that. This, this dev tools essentially says, hey, we're going to out output inline source maps, which again, we'll get to that in a minute once we kind of get this, this page all set up and going. So awesome. So let's check our checklist. So we have index.js and its dependencies. We have node modules. We're bundling them in a single file, source maps, and we got two versions out. Awesome, we're done. For that task away, we're moving on. All right, so the next, next task is the CSS task. It's very similar to our JavaScript task. We have one entry point file, index.scss. We're going to read that in its dependencies. We're going to compile it to a single file. Um, we're going to do something else kind of fun. We're going to add vendor prefixes because, well, Unfortunately, it's still a thing. It's been a thing for 10 years. Kind of sucks, but we're going to take care of it while we're at it. Um, and again, we're going to do two files and a developer directory and a production directory. So here we go. Whew. OK. We're going to first check out, again, that uh, tag for this. So it's git checkout CSS. And pretty much we have a message from git saying, hey, we're going to go into the CSS part of this talk now. So. Hooray. All right. Now here's our gulp file again. You'll notice we have a new task at the bottom, gulp CSS. Uh, very similar to what we have with JavaScript. We're going to have it point to a source folder, which is our index.scss. We're going to pipe it into SAS, which compiles our SAS file into CSS. We're going to do the last five versions of vendor prefixing, so i.e. probably back to six. Uh, maybe even earlier than that. Um, last five versions of Chrome, Firefox, you get the point. We're going to put that in the developer directory. We're going to minify it and drop it into production. So yeah, that's that's it. Again, it's not even not even 10 lines of code. And you have SAS working, you have Uglify working, and you have vendor prefixing like for free. You're welcome. So let's let's uh, let's take a look at how that looks. Kind of similar to our JavaScript task, it's, it's going to be it's going to be quick, so gulp CSS. Yep, 70 milliseconds. And that's 70 milliseconds back in your pocket, so uh, yeah, do with it what you will. But um, yeah, and if we take a look in our source, or in our source folder, we see that our index.scss file is just importing the layout file, which is, just happens to be right here, and that's just kind of a simple, simple little reset, and then we're going to set a nice, you know, fun fun gradient on our web page, which again we'll get to and you get to see how how beautiful that looks. It's, it's truly a work of art. Whew, okay, I think that's it. We did it. Uh, we have CSS, all the checklists are done, vendor prefixing is there. Let's move on. Image task. So this will kind of show you how Gulp, the source method, does multiple files. Before we were just pointing at one file and reading dependencies from there. This time we're saying, hey, look at a bunch of files, compile them down to one file. This will, this will do that for us automatically. Um, we're going to do a compression algorithm on it, so it you know, just makes sensible decisions on how the image looks and compresses it down. Um, and then we're going to move them again into our build directory. So you know, pretty much the same thing that we did with our uh, previous two tasks. So. Let's, uh, let's jump into that. Again, we're going to go back into our git command line, git checkout image. Oh. Cool. Image spelled the right way, not just IMG. Um, so we're in our image build now. If we go back to our uh, gulp file, we will see that we have a, uh, a third task now, appropriately named image. 
Um, and it has, in its source, called to gulp, we're now passing an array of files. Uh, these are globbing patterns, what they're called. So anything that ends in PNG, anything that ends in JPG, anything that ends in GIF, or GIF, however you pronunciate that, um, we're going to take all of those, we're going to pipe them all through this image min uh, function. It'll compress them to the, the three compression level, which is, I think, about a 30% reduction, depending on how well the image has been uh, made. And then we're going to, again, drop them in our two directories. So uh, memory serves me, I only have one image in there. Just a nice little, uh, just a nice little GIF there. Uh, so let's 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 uh, run this task, right? We did this, uh, wrote it all out. So let's run it. So zoom in here so you can see what I'm doing. Gulp image. You'll notice that uh, we ran into gulp image min. Didn't save anything because the image probably was already compressed before we got to it. But still, if it was a big image, we would have saved something. And again, really quick, 291 milliseconds. You probably can't even observe that. Um, just just because you're a human, I hope. So let's uh, let's let's jump into our final one of our final kind of boilerplate tasks, which is the HTML task. Um, this is a very simple task. If you have HTML files, it's just, just going to move them over into directories. So really, really straightforward. Um, again, we're going to check out the appropriate task. So it's a goal or a git. Excuse me. Check out HTML. So there's a the command. And now we're in the HTML portion of our build. So let's jump into that. I can only find it. OK. So similar to the previous task, we have a, a globbing pattern, which means, hey, we're just going to grab all of our HTML files. If you have one HTML file, if this is a single page application, this will probably just be index.html. Um, but if you have a bunch of them, you'll grab all of them. And essentially, it'll just move them into uh, into two different directories. What's nice about this is if you at one point have like a macro inside of your HTML or need some sort of like string replaced, it's really easy to do that. You'll just add a new pipe in here and replace whatever you want out of the HTML file. Um, it's really helpful like mocking tests and things. We don't, won't cover that unfortunately, but just kind of throw it out there if you need that. It's, it's pretty much baked in already. So um, yeah, let's, uh, let's run that task and So this one is really quick. I only have one H or one index file. It took 14 milliseconds, and we just moved it. I mean, that's it. What more do you need, right? So, okay. Awesome. So we got HTML in our directories. All right. This one's this one's near and dear to my heart. This is the test task. Uh, you're gonna have a lot of wins after this, I can tell you. Um, so essentially, we want to run unit tests anywhere we want, any browser. If you're supporting a lot of browsers, it's kind of a thing that you have to test on all of them, right? Well, this will let you do that. Um, we want to run them anytime we save the file. So as you're you know, writing unit tests for your code, anytime you trigger a save, it'll run those tests in the appropriate browsers. Or not. We can just run it once if we want and just have it do a clean run through and get our results right away. If you don't want to have it uh, constantly running, that's fine. Um, the only tricky thing now is we have some pre-processing uh, pre that we're doing now. So we need to have it happen before we run our tests. Um, and then we're going to add a little bit of sugar to Big Gulp. Uh, yeah, it'll just make your life a lot easier, trust me. So, uh, again, we're going to go back. We're going to run this command, get checkout test, so you can see all the, the fun stuff that happens. So, get checkout test. Cool. And we are now in our test portion of the build. Okay, so at the very bottom here we have a, a test task. I've also wrote a little comment kind of on how to use this sugar thing. So, so you're probably asking yourself, hey, you're doing tests, like what framework, what test runner are you using? Um, and the answer is yes, we are using all those things. So we have a Karma configuration file because we're using Karma. Um, Karma is a uh, test runner that lets you run in pretty much any browser you want. It's super handy to run in like mobile browsers, all you have to do is give people a link to this uh, web server that Karma creates and you can run tests in their browser. Um, so our, our Gulp source is kind of a little against what most Gulp plugins do. We're not actually passing it a source file. Karma sort of takes care of it for us in this configuration file. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, 
But essentially, we're going to pass it the browsers that we want to run. And then we're going to either supply it a watch task, which obviously just watches and waits for file save events, or the run task, which just runs it immediately and exits. Um, so if you see in my comment up here, you can pass browsers by just doing a uh, dash dash browser and then a comma separated list of the browsers. Or you can pass it another switch, which is just watch. So dash dash watch will trigger watch mode. Um, let's take a quick look back at our Karma configuration file. So Karma comes out of the box with, with a ton of options. You can specify the frameworks you want to use. In this case, we're using the Mocha framework and the uh, sign on chai um, sort of assertion suite. We're also going to tell it to load any .mspec files in, the, in our directory. So there's only one right now, but if we had more, it would grab all those as well and run them. This is sort of where the fun part is right here. We say that anytime that you load a preprocessor, or sorry, anytime you load one of these mspec files, we want to run this preprocessor webpack alongside of it. Um, that essentially takes our test files, compiles them, runs them, you get the idea. Uh, we require that same webpack configuration fire file I showed you earlier. Um, and I think that's pretty much about it. Yeah, there's a bunch of other options if you want to you know, change the port that it serves on, but that's kind of not as exciting, so we're not going to go into that too much. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's do this. I'm going to show you the test file that I have, which is right here. We essentially require that same person class that I showed you earlier, and we just start writing unit tests on it. So let's run some commands and see how it goes. So the first command is essentially just the run, run once sort of a task. So if we do gulp test and we don't do anything by default, it'll just run it one time and it'll run it in Chrome. So that was it. You may have seen a blink behind the screen. That was actually Chrome starting, running the test, and then exiting really quickly. Um, so it took a couple seconds to run, which is pretty good, pretty good performance. Um, and we had one of one success. So that one test that we wrote succeeded. Now let's say we want to do something really fun and let's tell it to run in a, another uh, couple more browsers here. So you'll see I have browsers set to Firefox and Chrome. I'm going to pause here for a minute and let you just let you take that in because we just ran an entire unit suite test in two browsers in 2.32 seconds. That's a big win as far as I'm concerned. So let's let's add one more thing to it. We're going to throw Safari into the mix. 0.2 seconds more to have Safari run unit tests with it. I mean, that's, I don't know, if you're not already singing about that, I, I, I feel sorry for you. So, okay, so that's all good. Let's, uh, let's turn it down just to Chrome again, and we're going to do the watch. Let's show you what that's about. Okay, so we ran the test suite. As you can see, we had the success that we sort of anticipated. Now we have a new Chrome tab open, and this is actually Chrome written to run unit tests, as you can see, it's idle. So let's, uh, let's write something that kind of blows up, and see, if it, uh, see if it fails. So I'm just going to write a really quick kind of bad test here. Spelling error here. Cool. So we have, uh, we're saying that true, or excuse me, false is true, which clearly is not. And as you can see, that we have, uh, Chrome is reporting that we have a failure. We ran two tests, but one failed. So that's kind of a bummer. Let's fix it really quick. We're going to change false to true. I'm going to zoom in really quick so you can uh, see, the, see the tests here. So we just changed this from false to true, just to kind of make the test pass. And then go back and we can see that we've had two successful events. So I didn't have to start anything, it was just running in the background. As soon as I saved that file, just kicked off the test suite and we're ready to go. Um, the really, really nice thing about this too is it's very easy to have Sauce Labs or Browser Stack, another third party uh, service to run in like Android or iPhones if you need like a mass amount of you know, browsers to run tests in. Um, it's very easy to defer this. Um, fortunately, we won't cover it today, but um, send me a note and I'll show you how to do that. It's pretty, it's pretty quick. So let's, uh, let's kick out of this task here. All right, so man, we got some great tests going. We can run them in any browser. 
So let's, let's set up the kind of the, almost one of our last final tasks. We have a tunnel task that essentially just opens up our web app to outside traffic. Again, we're going to uh, check out the appropriate tag for that. So you see we just did a get checkout tunnel. Probably used to that now. Actually, I probably should clear up my changes. Oh, took it, okay. So here we go, we have a tunnel task now. There is a NPM package called local tunnel, which if you've ever used uh, the Ruby Gem local tunnel, this essentially sets up a, a, a tunnel to your local machine so you can open up any port to outside traffic. Um, we have, so essentially you pass it an app port and it has a callback with you know two parameters, an error if there's a, a problem or tunnel. Um, and then I just have a little uh, utility here that prints out where we're gonna be seeing this. Um, this is super handy. This is a great example of not needing to have a gulp plugin. This is just a function. So there's no gulp source in here. It's just kind of a third party thing that I pulled in and ran it. So this kind of gives credence back to the whole fact that gulp is pretty, pretty uh, malleable. You can do whatever you want with it. You can have a function be anything you want. You can have a function do math if you want for crying out loud. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility in how gulp runs. So now if I uh, go back here and do gulp tunnel, we get a little URL for the tunnel. So that's nice. We have a, you know, a URL people can visit our website from, but hey, we still don't actually have a server that serves that website. So probably should fix that. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So we're going to also build in the, the default task as well with this, but, um, and a watch task. So this is kind of a, a multi-part multi -part slide. Uh, and uh, it covers a little bit of ground. So we're gonna check this out. Again, go check out watch, or excuse me, get check out watch. Awesome, so now we're on the watch slash default slash web server task. Whew, okay. So here's our, here's our watch task. Um, this introduces the final part of the Gulp API, which is watch. Um, Watch is very similar to source. You pass it a selection of um, files you want it to sort of keep its eye on, and then you pass it the task that you want it to run when it sees a file change there. So we're essentially saying, hey, any HTML file, when it's saved, run the HTML task, and similar to below. Um, we also have a connect server running as well, so we can serve this, this website, and then same thing, pass it the port, and exactly what it's serving. So we're serving the developer directory um, yeah, that, that's it for the Gulp Watch. About, what, 10 lines, 11 lines of code. Very, very easy to see what's going on, easy to maintain, all that, you know, sort of fun stuff. And then sprinkled throughout, you'll notice that we have a connect live reload. So essentially we have live reload baked into this application. So anytime you save a file, it compiles everything and it tells the browser to update. So pretty much the only thing you need to do is save a file and you get everything else for free. Compiling it, and viewing it immediately. So let's uh, let's see what this sort of uh, sugar looks like right after we do the default. Um, the default task essentially is just default, and then you pass it the tasks that you want to run in the background um, when it's called. So essentially, we're saying anytime I just type gulp, run these four things, and it'll it'll do that. Um, it'll kick them off all at the same time. It's not like serial; it does them all in parallel, so they all start and they all end at different times potentially. Um, which is what we want. They're not interwoven at all. So let's let's check that out. So if I just type in gulp. We see that we compiled the whole application in probably a second, if even that. Um, so super speedy, very nice. So now let's try our gulp watch task. Awesome. So we have our tunnel set up to point to the right spot. And we also have our little local server. So I'm gonna grab that first really quick. So I just copied the, uh, the URL there. Gonna open up a new tab here in Chrome. And there's that beautiful gradient I was telling you about earlier. You're probably curious to see, uh, see where that came from. Uh, also, you'll also notice that we also get our console statement that we had printed out earlier. So name shows up there. I can show you a little bit more of the source code here. if it'll let me. 
Yeah, so here's here's kind of our bundled up JavaScript. We have um, that console statement right here for joel.getName, and it's printing that name. So we had everything bundled up properly, we had everything execute, didn't have any warnings or, or problems. Let's, uh, let's do something else though. Let's, uh, let's change it up. Since we're watching, we should be able to change code on the fly and uh, you know see that immediately. So I'm going to also do an alert. So just a quick alert says, hey, here I am. Boom. And as soon as I saved, it actually kicked me back over and alerted. So wow, that was really neat. Didn't even have to press the reload button, which again is milliseconds of time right back in your pocket. So I'm going to XNA that and pull it out. And again, no alerts now. We can even do something fun. Let's change our gradient. So here's our um, source file for our, our CSS. Let's change this to one of my favorite colors. Hopefully it would be, yeah, there it is. You notice that we had a change in the, the color or before it was a nice blue gradient. We kind of blew that away and did this sort of really ugly sunrise color. Change it back and back to normal. So as soon as you save, you get all that stuff for free, everything compiles on its own, you're good to go. Um, yeah, so that's that's the basics. We have everything building, we have everything compiling. On a watch task, it does it automatically. We can run browser tests anywhere we want. Um, so you're probably asking yourself, hey, like what else is there? Is there something else more you can do? And uh, to that I say, yes, there is. So we have our watch task, which we just covered. And of course, we have time. You're obviously on the internet doing nothing right now, so let's let's talk about this. First thing is ES6, right? ES6 is the next iteration of JavaScript. Um, so it's still new, hasn't been released yet, uh, but there are people out there that have already written called what's called transpilers for this. So you can take what ES6 stuff you've written right now and put it back into a version that browsers now can understand. So it's like having the future now, which is really exciting. Um, the last thing is notifications too. If I have that watch task running, it might be nice to get a little drop down notification saying, hey, this is done, you're good to go here. So let's, let's put that in there too, just, just kind of make our workflow a little nicer. Um, the only trick is, this isn't a tag anywhere that's specific, you have to check out my super secret hidden, hidden tasks branch. So uh, yeah, not so hidden anymore I suppose, but okay. So we're gonna check that out. So get check out hidden tasks, boom. And we are now on the branch that has our code. Okay, let me close out some stuff here. So we, we said we wanted ES6 and we wanted notifications. Let's cover notifications first. So in kind of sprinkled in throughout, anytime I have some task building properly, I have a little notify pipe that happens. So for JavaScript, it just pretty much says, hey, your JavaScript is done. For CSS, pre-process, images, all those other things have a little notification that we get when they're done. So let's, uh, let's run it, see what happens. So I'm gonna run the JS task. Uh, and if we got a notification there, but I don't see it happening here, maybe because we're probably plugged into a monitor, I would guess. Uh, that's all right. When you pull this down and run it, because I know you will, you will see that it is very, very handy. Um, just to, especially when you're watching, just makes it a lot easier to see that notification come down. The last part we talked about we were going to do is a uh, ES6. So inside of our JavaScript files, I created a new animal file. So you'll notice this new class keyword, which you probably never have seen anywhere in JavaScript, because that's an ES6 new keyword. Um, new property called constructor, and then we're going to have a new method called get animal type, which is pretty much regurgitates whatever we put into it, um, and then we export it. So. Again, not, nothing too fancy, but this is something that a browser now would not understand. It would probably throw a reference error if you try to run it. Okay, and then in our index file, we now use the new import syntax to import that file. And then we make a cat type, and then we console, hey, get, get animal type. So let's uh, see if it works. Whew, it's pretty, pretty exciting. So if I do my watch task again, there we go. We got all of our scripts done. Got our little link to our uh, website. I'm gonna put that in. And if you notice, ah, it's that second statement printed out. So we do have ES6 running in the browser like it should. 
that's a pretty big deal. I'm not sure if you guys have ever used any sort of ES6 uh, you know, code, but there's a lot of really nice things that come in ES6, and we can have that now. We can have it today and run it uh, in, in your browser. So super, super handy. Um, you may be asking yourself, well, that's great. Well, how did you do that? What, what magic did you use to do that? So I'm going to go back to my Webcat, Webpack config and show you how that sort of happens. Um, inside of this configuration file, we have a module property that has a loaders property, which is a little redundant, but whatever. In it, I'm saying, hey, any file that has a .js end to it, run this loader behind it. So that essentially takes our ES6 file, reruns it, and compiles it so browsers can understand it, and then outputs it. So it's a little ugly, but if you wanted to see it, like, here it is. I'm going to show it to you. Hide your children. It's going to get hairy. So, yeah, there's these weird things like, oh, what's, what's PRS? I don't even know what that means. So, so this kind of shows a little bit of a drawback that, hey, it's great. You can have it, but it doesn't really compile into, like, human-readable code. So just kind of be forewarned when you do that you might end up with something a little ugly to debug later on. Um, but again, it's more experimental. It's up to you if you guys want to use it. I think it's great. Um, it just kind of gives you some nice things that are coming down the line, gets you familiar with them before they actually happen. So, you know, do what you will with that. Okay, so I think that's about it. That's about all I have time for you guys. Um, you know, thanks so much for tuning in and checking this out. I hope it's useful to you. I look forward to talking to you again soon.